my next guest um, initially when we had the first uh, budget presentation, said, uh, this is optimistic, a little too optimistic. Um, he is in the position this morning where he could say, I told you so, but he's not doing that. He is a former government minister and energy consultant, Mr. Conrad Ennell. A very good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. It is great to have you here. The, um, the situation here is that we have a small amount coming in we have obligations for a lot and some of the infrastructural things we anticipated that were discussed and projected are not yet in place which to me um spells of more difficult times to come if you simply wish that something will happen and you put absolutely nothing in place to deal with it mm -hmm. then your wish will be achieved. That is to say, what has occurred? We have a situation in Trinidad and Tobago where the infrastructure needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. That means that wherever it is, you have to transform it. And if you don't know how to transform it, then simply talking about it will not get the results that you're looking for. So let's talk about infrastructure. The facts are that in Trinidad and Tobago today, we have a situation where the energy sector has contributed immensely to the prosperity that we now enjoy. Mm -hmm. 2016 was a diff different year because it was the first year in which a number of things occurred. It is the first year in which the energy sector contribution to the revenue of Trinidad and Tobago has been significantly reduced. But that is not in itself a bad thing because the country, by virtue of how it has managed its affairs before, mm -hmm. had the ability for some short period of time to borrow its way out of this particular difficulty. It has done that. And in my own view, by 2017, 2018, the situation should be a little less challenging because energy sector revenues should, in fact, start to flow mm. back to the government. Just that I'm clear on that, sir. The last time you were here, you said we should not expect much coming out of a revisit to the higher um, cost of, 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 of oil products, about oil in particular, and, 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 and gas because um, of our obligations and the concessions that have been given. Are you, are, you, are you changing that position? No, I'm not. I'm simply saying that the concessions were given for a period of three years, 2016, 20, gotcha. yeah, yeah. Okay. and therefore, okay. once that moratorium... Um, so, so let's just deal with two quick issues that can confuse. One is the price of the product. The other one is the profitability of the entity. Uh, energy companies are not going to not be profitable. Right. Profitability is a good thing because it multiplied by a rate gives you tax revenue. So that it is in the interest of the country to ensure that it's uh, infrastructure allows energy companies or all companies to be profitable mm -hmm. because that profitability mm -hmm. means that the country shares in that by their payment of taxes. Yes. It is that issue that has created a problem for us now. They are not as profitable as they used to be for a number of situations and they have not had the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. Over the period of time, if you listen to the various leaders, you would hear them say, that we are doing a couple of things. We are becoming more efficient, we are reducing our cost, and we are in fact retooling so that whenever the situation changes as it does because it is cyclical, that is to say it goes up and it goes down, mm -hmm. we would be able to benefit from it, that. Once they benefit from that, the country is gonna benefit from that. And therefore I continue to say that we need to understand that this particular issue that we find ourselves in is temporary at best, but it allows us the opportunity to do some things now that we would not be able to do if um, our situations were not what it is today. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure um, utterances, um, the, the, the projections made, and the lack of getting the infrastructure organized, I, I, I gather you also include in that the ability to collect. That is a major part of the infrastructure and for years now we've had the situation um, and, and you know I heard your last speaker talk a lot about uh, procurement and a number of those issues and the question of standardization. Mm -hmm. 
if you have to respond to different markets and, and different segments, um, standardization does not work. What works is your ability for accountability and transparency. And to me, those are the issues that you have to work through because transparency and accountability, for example, in energy does not have to do with $1 million. It has to do with $10 million US mm -hmm. because that's the nature of that business. Whereas in tourism, it's 10 cents. Mm -hmm. So that one cannot basically, at this point in time, based on the diversified and difficult uh, and global circumstances in which we find ourselves in, really look at one size fits all. You have to look at competitiveness you have to look at industry norms and you have to look at best practices. So the conversation to me has to be about um, different to administrative type conversations mm -hmm. and more sort of like innovation, entrepreneurship, um, creation of value and those kind of things. So there's, there has to be a different conversation. Mr. Conrad Enel, my guest here, a former finance minister and energy consultant, we are talking about the state of the economy, specifically uh, in the area of, um, of our export, our major source of revenue. Um, and before I go into the whole question of recession, I want to stay with something that the finance minister vowed to tackle, which was transfer pricing. He promised that during fiscal 2070. Um, he's saying he was engaging the Inter-American Center for Tax Administration traders to help uh, because since 2011 the country is estimated to have lost 1.4 billion dollars per year uh, to transfer policy in the LNG industry explain to our listeners please what does this mean the whole issue of transfer pricing transfer pricing is an issue that is global um, it has to do with multinationals and how they reduce their tax liability or come or country or companies that operate at different uh, segments of the value chain. Well, let me put that differently. Um, if you are exporting to a market and you set up an institution that you own mm -hmm. and you take the product from where it is um, developed and you sell it to your company and then that company sells it to a foreign entity, mm -hmm. It means that you could decide at what price you are going to transfer the product from one company to the other. And because you own it, there's a question of your ability to determine what that price is on the basis of what your objective is, as opposed to what the price should really be on the basis of the market return that you get. What has happened in many instances is this, especially in LNG. Once the product is sold, <clears throat> for example, and it leaves the shores of Trinidad and Tobago, and it goes to another entity. Mm -hmm. The same product can be sold again. And in one instance, I am aware of um, a product that was sold or a shipment that was sold 17 times. And profit was made on every sale. So let us see. I make the sale to Tom in the United States at 10 cents. He then takes it, sells it to Canada for 20 cents. Canada now takes the same product, sells it across the Yugoslavia for 50 cents. And then they do the circle and they come around and they send it up to Canada for $120. Except, that the sort of thing except for about? one thing. In all those situations, you own all of those institutions. Mm -hmm. You own Tom, you own Harry, mm -hmm. you own Nick, and so on. And therefore, the question that arises or has arisen is that <laughs> if you have set it up that way and your destination is the furthest destination, anyhow, for which you're getting a benefit, why are we not benefiting from that? Gotcha. It's, that's a simplistic way of explaining it. They have more elaborate uh, mechanisms. Schemes, yes, I'm sure. mm -hmm. uh, they're not schemes. We, we, you know, I, I don't want people to give to get the impression they are schemes. They are legitimate um, things that the companies can do as a result of how the law is set up. Mm. But what the law has to do as well is that it has to determine if these things are happening um, in a way in which the revenue stream is being interfered with, then you have to intervene to fix it. And uh, we have not paid particular attention, I think, to transfer pricing because um, the revenue streams that we were getting were sufficient to deal with our needs and, you know, it wasn't an issue. It has now become an issue mm -hmm. because of the uh, revenue issues. Uh, but even as you do that, the question that arises is this. Transfer pricing is a specialist kind of activity. And if you were to put a transfer pricing specialist in the Ministry of or in, or in Inland Revenue, um, I'm afraid you will not be able to pay them. Because remember that one of the issues with collection of taxes has to do with the level of resources that you can 
uh, basically a track. Mm. Um, mm. We've had this before when, for example, uh, insurance companies were not under the central bank. For an insurance company to sell a product, they require an actuary. An actuary is 12000 per hour. Mm. Based on the classification within the public service, um, the actuary price that the government would afford based on where he fits within professionals is $15,000 a month. So you have a skill issue mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of trying to uh, manage an institution or manage a sector that has grown way beyond the capabilities that currently exist. And it is for that reason that you have to find a different mechanism to deal with some of the higher end challenges. And that's why I would ask you to identify that infrastructure, that mechanism, because if you're looking at $1.4 billion, I understand what you're saying. You may have to pay for the expertise to uh, patrol this, to monitor this, and it may cost you half of that. But even if you lost half of $1.4 billion a year, it is a lot of money that you are, in fact, getting back to the yeah. Exchequer or the Treasury. Yeah. When I talk infrastructure, for example, I talk about not only the Ministry of uh, the Ministry of Finance, but the Ministry of Energy. Uh, for years now, we've been saying that the Ministry of Energy should not be within the public service. It should be delinked because you look at the energy sector contribution. You look at the complexity within the energy sector. You, you look at the skill sets that are required. Uh, you look at how the sector will be able to bring to their sector a level of human resource mm. Um, against the people, against the government. And you say, okay, so what is our response? And in many instances, when the Minister of Finance says that he has to go to the IMF and there are those who see it negatively, the reason that he's going to the IMF is because the IMF has expertise. that kind of expertise. Mm -hmm. And that's the only choice that he has because mm -hmm. he can't depend on his people because they are not at that particular level. All the good people have basically gone into the private sector and have basically done well. Are you encouraged by the reports that the BRR have, BIR has been for some time training its staff members on the in the area of uh, the uh, tax transfer? And they've been having a lot of seminars in the, this area. The, that's not the issue. Um, I can train anybody to do anything. Uh, what you are basically going to do is you're going to learn how to do things. Mm. But you are coming up against individuals who are experienced, who have knowledge, who have been you know, in this for a very mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. you need to get is you need to get a level of expertise that is superior to that because what you're basically looking at is an audit function. If you're learning it, if you're learning it you can't be audited at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, the, and the expertise that has to be developed has to be based on some other jurisdiction um, who has been successful in this particular matter and who are able to sit down and say to you, listen, on the basis of the experience that we've had, on the basis of trends, on the basis of our own analysis, here are some of the things that we think you should be looking for. Well, can I just then run with what you said? Um, and, and you said this the last time you were here too. Folks misunderstand uh, discussions with the IMF. They have the expertise and that's where you should go. So in this area of transfer pricing, it is beneficial to us to have that relationship and use that expertise um, to go against what it will cost us if we had to go on the market and get people to do it. Yeah, and there's an additional, there's an additional issue. The IMF is a global body. Yes. So it means that when they sit down and they come to your country, they would be looking at experiences in this yes. country, in Africa, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and therefore they are going to be able to bring to you a pool of expertise that you will not normally have. And um, as a member of the IMF, that's what you can do. Now, um, the IMF, as so, so there are two things about the IMF that we need to treat with very quickly. One is this. If the IMF is in your country, basically um, because you have no resources, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for years, Trinidad and Tobago has had what we call the Article 4 consultation annually, mm -hmm. where the IMF comes in and basically looks at what you're doing and say to you, listen, we have no issues with you, but here are some things that you should be looking at. Uh, they've been talking about uh, currency issues, they've been talking about uh, collection issues, they've been talking about uh, reform issues. And in many instances, if you understand that from the position of 
giving you something that you could look at. You mm -hmm. have decisions to make. You get an informed heads up you get as to what you're up. doing and where, yeah. you're, where you're heading and where they have seen this sort of direction end up in other um, jurisdictions. Absolutely correct. I got you. My guest this morning is Mr. Conrad NL. He is the energy consultant, former finance minister. Uh, we're talking about um, energy here on one side. We're also talking about uh, finance in some what some believe was a trial balloon. The minister hinted that government might raise fuel prices by another 15% in April. Is the citizenry ready for that one and two, you think, a pin got into that trial balloon? Well, so there's a lot of discussion about comments made by uh, the Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, to me, the question of increases in prices globally mm -hmm. is something that has really, uh, if you look at the evidence, it has really in many countries uh, been negatively uh, affect, uh, ne negatively uh, responded to by the population. Uh, one of the things that we know, for example, increases in prices in other jurisdictions really and truly um, create significant upheavals in populations. That's the trend. Really? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that if a Minister of Finance is able mm -hmm. to do that in Trinidad and Tobago and not have that um, occur, it is because of a couple of things. It is because the population understands what is taking place. But mm -hmm. more than that, it is because there are other alternatives that are available and there are other things that are happening. Trinidad and Tobago has not managed its resources as badly as others may think mm -hmm. if you look at mm -hmm. what is taking place in the rest of the world. So I think that the statement made by the minister was more an admission of success rather than an intention to um, you know, create some kind of, of, of difficulty. Because and by his natural extension, his statement that we have not seen riots that uh, he may have had a chuckle with was in fact making a comparison so folks understand. Is correct. that correct? Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that also in other jurisdictions, what would have happened is that you, the, the, the prices would have increased as a result of market reality, mm -hmm. which is not the case in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. the case of Trinidad and Tobago, there is an adjustment between market and what the government can afford. That's a fundamental difference to market reality because if it is market reality, it means that the population and the cost for the population mm -hmm. would be significantly higher. So there's a distinction. Got you. The other area we have to go into, as we said, a couple of statements uh, in the public arena that raise some uh, eyebrows, uh, particularly in the labor movement. Just before I go into my triple zero score, I do want to deal with the area, uh, something that he said that we should all be paying attention to. Minister said that TNT, Trinidad and Tobago, is almost at the point where it is difficult for us to borrow any more for budgetary support and capital development. Therefore, the only solution is growth. What areas would you... Um, interpret from that we need to put the attention to well um the statement deconstructed means as follows um the debt to the gdp ratio of the country uh is one area that we like to look at to tell us when we are getting into difficulty um, as an individual for example if you went to the bank the bank would look at your debt to income ratio and say mm -hmm. okay uh, if you're spending more than 75%, then we think you're in trouble because it means then that your ability to service uh, debt could be compromised. Mm -hmm. I think what the minister is saying is that we have borrowed, we have borrowed to live uh, for so long that we will no longer be able to borrow at the terms and conditions that we were able to. In other words, if we start to borrow now, the cost of borrowing is going to make borrowing difficult. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. you now have to look at other mechanisms for dealing with the shortfall. Got you. That's, that's basically what that is. Before I get to the elephant in the room, Nicole Oliveira uh, lost a position as Trinidad Tobago's Minister of Energy and Energy Industries in the, in the cabinet overhaul that just took place. How do you think uh, we will fare? What do you think of the decision, one, and how do you think we will fare with Franklin Khan now at the helm? I think in both instances there were challenges, um, but there is a significant 
backroom level of support um, for both uh, persons. Um, you have the Standing Committee on Energy, which is made up of all the technocrats and all the heads of the energy sectors. You have the Ministerial Committee that deals with issues. So there's a lot of technical support. I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue has to do with the leadership of the sector. Mm. And um, Franklin Khan, from where he sits, I think he brings to the table two things. He brings the chairmanship of the political organization uh, to bear. And I think that in so far as that is concerned, his ability to influence certain players uh, is a little bit different to that of uh, former minister Nicole Oliveri. And he has been involved in the industry for some time equally. And that is also a positive or a negative depending on, on, on how you want to play it. <laughs> But I think, yes, I think that he has, uh, so has so has Nicole Oliveri, actually, actually. But I think the difference is that the issues that we have to treat with now are transformational issues, and therefore mm. it requires um, a different kind of mindset and a different kind of um, diplomacy. Um, the, the, you know, when the industry is in transformation, you need a particular kind of leader. When the inf in industry is in maintenance, you need a different kind of leader. I mm -hmm. think that the leader that is required now is the transformational tech leader. And I think that on the face of it, Franklin Khan represents, in my view, uh, a mix of experience and a mix of knowledge that can assist in that process. And I wish him well because... There are many, many issues that he needs to resolve, mm -hmm. the least of which being the future of the petrochemical sector in the face of shale uh, gas and shale oil mm -hmm. and the whole question of the new model for energy sector development. That new m model is uh, something that's attracting the attention uh, worldwide, uh, not only from the, the the competition that comes from shale, but also the environmental threat that is uh, associated with that. It's 15 minutes away from the top of the hour. We're adjusting how we maximize our gain from our natural resources is dependent on incentives and disincentives. One area of concern is the increase in the green fund levy and business levy rates. The business levy does not impact the production and uh, exploration uh, aspect of it, but the green fund levy does it is a minimal levy that has been increased from uh, 0.1% 0.1% .1 to 0.3% on gross revenues what does this mean for the companies who are doing the exploration it depends if a company is basically so so let us look at what is happening right now right now income tax or corporation tax is based on profits mm -hmm. So a company that is doing a billion dollars worth of business but has expenditure because it is going out and doing work absolutely pays zero taxes. What these taxes do is that they take it at the top. Mm -hmm. And it means that in spite of that, you have to pay it. So your $1 billion will have some cost associated with it. Uh, from that perspective, so the government gets something out of it. It was simply a mechanism to deal with companies that were, over time, legitimately posting losses, but were doing large volumes of revenue and were, in fact, utilizing services. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a mechanism to correct that. And um, uh, usually what will occur is that they will simply look at it as part of the cost of business and they will either reduce their margins or they will pass it on to the final consumer. To the extent that some of these consumers are external, then the issue doesn't really arise as it relates to the local um, value add. So, you know, it's it's, it's 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 one of those things. The United Nations uh, World um, Investment Report of 2015 stated that Trinidad and Tobago, the Bahamas, and Jamaica were the largest destinations for foreign direct investment. Uh, that's where capital flows to small island developing states. That uh, would uh, depend on fiscal reform, infrastructural, and an environment that supports investment as a priority. Do you believe that the government here is facilitating such an environment to keep that uh, foreign direct investment coming to Trinidad and Tobago? Well, you have to disaggregate that statement because what I would like them to talk about is take it out outside of energy and see what happens. To the extent that you have $12 billion worth of plant in the country, there has to be, over time, foreign direct investment to keep that plant running. Mm. No, I mean, the companies spend on an annual basis just on maintaining their uh, programs because remember that they have assets here, and those assets have to be maintained at a level 
based on health and safety requirements, and therefore um, those investment dollars must come to protect that, that investment. Mm. If you take that out, um, does the equation still hold? And I think not. And I really think that uh, what mm. has to be looked at is whether or not you have foreign direct investment coming into other segments of the of the sector rather than mm-hmm. this very mature and very um, you know robust energy sector that you have in Trinidad and Tobago. Or more than just bare maintainers. Well, uh, the evidence suggests that certainly in the case of some of the larger players, mm-hmm. um, you are in fact going to have more than that. But, ju- but just to make an, uh, one point, um, the, 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 the energy sector, while it is moving into a different segment of its cycle, its life cycle, um, its success is going to be dependent on a decision that the government has to make, and it is this. If you are going to offer to companies deep sea acreage, mm-hmm. one of the questions that arises is if they are successful, how do they, how do they get their product to the market? And to the extent that you haven't answered that question, then the investment will not come. The government may have to decide on a fifth train because that is how you get product from uh, um, plant to the market. Uh, The four trains that we have right now, they have some issues with gas, and I think those are going to be resolved shortly. But in a real sense, they're operating at uh, capacity, and therefore... If you get more product coming in, there's no processing capability. So that inherent in that decision and moving forward is also the decision about processing capability in order to convert that into revenue streams. Mm-hmm. For uh, make that 13 minutes away from the top of the hour, I cannot uh, move too far afield without dealing with what caused the greatest disquiet, particularly in the trade union uh, movement. Uh, they said that uh, in many ways it was undermining the process of the bargaining process, the Prime Minister had to come and reiterate and reassure that that was not the case. The uh, Finance Minister had to call a meeting to clarify what he meant in the context of wage restraint as against wage freeze. This all uh, was the outcome of a zero, zero, zero um, suggestion. And the Minister quickly said this is a starting point. Many argue, well, I will ask you to comment on that firstly, which seems to explain itself. He said we will not exceed 14%, by the way. Um, so, so, so that in itself is a negotiating thing. It starts at one point. But many saying that for an experienced person like the finance minister, this was not the forum to make such an announcement. Do you concur or are you at variance with that? Well first, well, first of all, let's deal with experience. The minister... It's the first time that he's operating as a finance minister, and therefore he does not have experience as a finance minister. Being a finance minister requires a different mindset because one of the challenges in, in, in being a minister of finance is that no matter what you say, somebody is going to be offended. So you have to say <laughs> uh, things in such a way that no one is offended because you have to work with everybody. So I think that... Um, as a Minister of Finance, you almost have to be 24-7 um, understanding that any statement that you make is either going to create positives or negatives, and you have to ensure mm-hmm. your success as a finance minister is based, quite frankly, on having a lot of neutral type conversations in a real sense or positive conversations. Mm-hmm. In that sense, therefore, if you look at it that way, I would not have made the statement quite that way. Because um, while zero 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 seems to be an option on the basis of what you see now, um, you are cutting away. You are taking away from the from those who you have to work with the opportunity for them to offer you alternatives mm. and to offer you um, solutions that you may not be um, at this point in time considering or even be aware of. And therefore, to me. That's not a place that you should try to go. You should always try to go to the stage where um, you get others to help you with the problems that you have because it's not your problem, it is our problem. And in that regard, therefore, the Minister of Finance, in my view, has to be a lot less um, definitive about future action and a lot more accommodating for ideas. and, and, And if that is the situation, then that's something that should have been uh, negotiated around the table 
where everything else has failed mm. rather than simply um, spoken about as a possibility. You spoke about accommodation. The minister, we should make it very clear, the finance minister did have meetings, um, a meeting uh, with the members of the labor community at which uh, there was... Um, Let's just say uh, the easing of the uh, of the tension that came as a consequence of this. There is still the question that I, I want to target at you, um, Mr. Enel, and that is the question of was this the right forum for this? And uh, there are many people who believe that uh, this was a undermining, uh, uh, again, of the bargaining process, and some felt that the person to have raised this should have been the CPO. Your take on this? Well, it depends. If I'm in an IMF meeting and we're really talking fiscal policy and we're talking the success of the policy and we're talking about future issues and whatever you say or however you say it is going to affect you globally and internationally based on the fact that it's an IMF uh, meeting um, I can understand why the temptation would be there to say it however um, that's one of the challenges you face um, in the real implementation of the activity the minister is not going to be able uh, to do it quite the way he's done it uh, because the CPO is his negotiating, mm. um, for you know, and, and within that public sector negotiating committee, there's a mechanism for it, for it to deal with. But um, a couple of years ago, I also found myself in a similar situation where, in looking at pension issues, um, somebody asked me a question, and I raised it in a particular way, and it caused the IMF great concern. So you always have to manage your communication, notwithstanding mm. where you are so that you understand the implications of what you see. And you say it in such a way that it does not lead to disquiet and discomfort for those who you have to work with. I think that that's that's the biggest lesson coming out of of, of being in the minister being a minister of finance or a minister of energy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because what happens is that analysts sit down and they analyze everything, everything that you see. Yes. And it is on the basis of that analysis that decisions are made either positively or negatively. Therefore, you have an obligation when you hold those positions to be absolutely, absolutely uh, concerned about statements that you make. And therefore, you have to hold yourself to a different standard. If the reports are correct, then then I, I, I must um, um, salute the maturity of the industry to listen that the, um, the the minister had a bad day, as it were. And I know your position is in this kind of in this posting, you don't have bad days because every day you must be on. There, this is, you know, this is like Disneyland. You're always the, the, the behavior is always on stage. <laughs> Wherever you are, it's on stage. And if you're yes. having a bad day, stay home. You know, don't go to work on that day. <laughs> because, the, because the damage that you can do yes. simply by virtue of somebody I'm listening to you yes. and saying, well, you know, I was going to go down there, but mm-hmm. if you're going to have a fight with the unions, then that's not a place to go. Let's go somewhere else. Means that people are not able to sit down with you and negotiate. So whatever you say has to be taken as gospel. There's another part of it. If, if I say uh, generally, as the, as the Minister of Finance said, um, understand the difficulty we are facing here as, as a nation, and I am not going to exceed, we are not going to exceed 14%. I expect most unions will come in and say let's start at 14%. But not, yeah, but not only that. I mean, you shouldn't say that because mm-hmm. if 15% is going to give me a rate of productivity that I consider appropriate and help me with revenue streams. Don't box yourself. Then I'm, I'm going to 15%. Yes, so, yes. you know, it's 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 not one size fits all. You don't box yourself in. That's no, exactly it's, what we're saying. You have to be open at all points in time to hear all mm-hmm. issues mm-hmm. because within the context of those conversations, there may be things that you didn't think about and things that are clearly very workable. Mm -hmm. The minister, um, and and I mentioned uh, uh, earlier the question of a trial balloon, because I mean, you know, statements, uh, this is another context now, in the area where he mentioned that electricity in Trinidad and Tobago is the lowest in the Caribbean, uh, I believe he said it was six times uh, lower than even Jamaica, he alluded or made clear that we have subsidized water, electricity, education, public transportation, all these things are known. All right, fine, it was an echo, but I always believe that we echo things heading somewhere. Well, the thing, yeah, and the thing about it is if you are getting the level of resources that you're getting from the energy sector and the energy sector is, uh, and by virtue of that, you are able to spend it in that way, 
you are really benefiting the people that are trying to beg. You're not benefiting the people of Guyana or, or Suriname or someplace else. Mm-hmm. And the question that um, should be asked is, what is wrong with the people of trying to beg or getting a benefit? So what is wrong with the people that are trying to beg or getting subsidies? Mm-hmm. So no, the, but I just meant because in, in, the, in the same area, I believe, um, and, and uh, you know, I should not be even attempting to speak for the Minister of Finance. I am not. But my interpretation of what he said was the same thing you have said. In good times, you had all these things. These are bad times. Don't expect to have a maintenance of but, all yeah, these. But there's a difference between saying that and saying what can we do as opposed to agreeing or deciding that I will do this, that, and the other. Because I think in some instances, um, you know, water, listen, the subsidy on electricity has to do with how we configure the sector. Mm. We've basically configured the sector so that royalty gas goes into electricity production. And basically that is a benefit to the people at Trinidad and Tobago being part of the energy sector. I mean, if that is what it is, that is what it is. And as a consequence of that, you have low cost. And therefore, the focus, therefore, should be on efficiency rather than increasing the costs. There is a a political third rail, and I'm going to ask you to... to hazard an opinion on this, uh, or maybe I should just ask you for your own observation. The um, labor labor community, have they, in your estimation, have they been realistic, have they been mature as to the reality that the country faces in some of the demands we're hearing for immediate payment? or payments? From the perspective of the labor movement, I think that they are correct. And they are correct because if you can find resources to do other things, the question that they will ask is, why are we not a priority? Um, I think that one has to be careful in how one allocates resources Mm. so that one cannot be accused of favoring one or the other. And I think that without explaining why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it and your rationale for doing it, uh, people may disagree with that. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But if Mm -hmm. you understand that, then disagreement is different. I may disagree with you from not knowing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if I don't know, then I am free to make demands that are all over the place. But if I understand why you're doing it, I can say I don't agree with you. And that's fine. Because at the end of the day, I'm in charge. Right. I have things to do. Uh, and I think that what may be missing is the conversation around explaining what is taking place. Is that not what the tripartite uh, conversations were intended to achieve? Well, I think that that was the intention, but like everything else, um, you you have to spend a lot of time um, with people learning their skill sets, learning how they communicate. And I do not believe that the players that you have within the system have the time for that. Mm. They're very busy people. Mm. So they're not, they're going to come, they're going to try to get this out of the way. But the problem with the tripartite conversation is that if we talk about productivity and you get an explanation of productivity from the three sectors, they mean different things. And therefore, you have to sit down and work through what that means. And that necessarily takes time. So I think that... In common area, yes. Mm -hmm. I I think time is is, is the issue. You have to spend the time. Tell me if I am correct in the waning moments we have here. You sound a bit more optimistic this time. Uh, Maybe I'm hearing it with a different set of ears, but you sound more optimistic this time about some uh, recovery because of the moratorium you mentioned that will run out, that that whole um, situation that would yield more money for the country. And and, and you sound more optimistic about oil fortunes um, in, in an upward trajectory. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, I think that um, in, in some of the things that were done in the past, we will benefit from it as we go forward. Mm-hmm. I think that my concern was how we would have withstood 2016 and going into 2017. And from where I sit, we have the fiscal space and there are a number of things that we are doing, which in my view will allow us to sort of stabilize a little bit. Um, And I think that there is a recognition that is taking place now that there are things that we could be doing, that there are things that the government cannot do, and therefore it is up to others um, to fill that gap. And I think that I I see evidence that others are, in fact, 
uh, moving forward on that. Um, I think in some instances I hear conversations um, that allow me to believe that individuals uh, by and large are taking more control of their own circumstances as a result of what is taking place. And to me, that is very positive. Providence dictate that I quit while I am ahead. (laughs) 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 Tis true to say (laughs) that we are, you are a little more encouraged. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 no. I I absolutely have a lot of faith in the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I have a lot of faith in uh, the wisdom of the people. And I think that... uh, um, if you simply provide them with the infrastructure and some encouragement and give them hope, they will do the rest. And I think that that's a good place to be. Energy Minister, former Finance Minister, uh, Mr. Conrad Enel, again, always good to have you here. As a friend of mine would always say, the more I talk to you, the smarter I get. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me this morning. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Have you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week ahead. I want to thank all my guests for being here. Errol Lewis from New York One, CNN in New York City. Thank you so much, Errol. Rishi Maharaj, who is the CEO of Disclosure today. Thank you for taking your time to be with us. Uh, Byron, uh, Brian um, Serrett, the v- former Vice President of Pan Trimbago, also a very big thanks to you and my final guest, Mr. Conrad Enel. My name is Ronnie Bishop. We are at a new time uh, on the morning show. That's Michel Borrell and yours truly. We'll be in at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. As you move, we move, which means you get up at 5 o'clock. You lock us in right here at 107.7, and we take you all the way into the office at 9 o'clock. Have yourself a wonderful day, a good Sunday, and I'll join you again next week at this same time for us to have another mm, cup of coffee. Mixed with some sort of uh, lunch. It's called brunch. I'm out of here.